Grand Rising, my friends. Hey there to the most beautiful subscribers in half of the Milky Way. The good half. <laughs> the And if you're new, hey there, join us. Gather around as we go in depth on very shallow topics. <laughs> Ready in case I can look to see where I'm gonna stay on topic. The ETH look, this the reason why we talk about the Ethereum burning, why it's important is at some point there's going to be a supply shock where people who want to buy Ethereum are gonna to need to buy Ethereum for their functions of their contracts are not gonna be able to, it's gonna be difficult and that makes the price go up. But we're not here always for the price to go up because then it makes things securities and it's all about the utility of function. So funny how uh, the markets are uh, react. Bitcoin is doing well. The entire cryptocurrency market, Bitcoin at 57,526. Ethereum at 3,616. Binance coin at 470. Cardano was down a little bit. It's popped up a little bit today. It was down at like 210, I think, yesterday. Now it's at 219. XRP at 113, Solana 148. So, Axie Affinity at 121 dollars. Remember, I think we was at 90 not so long ago, and we were saying that it was like at like 70 cents or something a year, less than a year ago. And this is why the market, crypto market, people they want those insane returns. But who? <clears throat> It's with great difficulty to be able to see that in advance. When the people put their money into an Axie Infinity last November is because they want to play Axie Infinity. And who knew? You got a bunch of children who got rich because, <laughs> you know, they want to play this game. I was, I was telling the people around me, like, look, you playing these little candy crushing little games like that, we're going to find you crypto games to play, where it's play to earn. The difference from pay to win, where you can pay money to advance in a game, versus which has been the old model in the fiat system, where now the model is play to earn. By playing these games, you can earn cryptocurrency, which over time can be swapped for other cryptocurrencies or appreciating value. So it's a play to earn model. And the money is, of course, generated from you probably have to put some money, stake some money going there with like an NFT as your character. And, it, you know, that's what a lot of NFT market is having these games built around the NFT collection where you have to have a character or an NFT from the collection to even, you know, to have like a chip in the game. And then you can earn the currency in the game and then swap that out for on um, a swap like Sunday Swap or Ave Sushi Swap, Pancake Swap, on these decentralized exchanges, you find a trading pair for, you, you know, for example, Zombie Toads is an NFT that will buy, hold on, let me, so Zombie Toads is an NFT that is buying Cryptoads. And you see the floor for Cryptoads at 7.4 Ethereum now. So, and it's 7,000 Cryptoads with 3,000 owners. So that, that's a collection, Cryptoads. Zombie Toads is another collection of 5,600 separate NFTs with a floor price now 0.43 that part of their communal pie that they'll get from the buying and selling of their own um, zombie toads is to buy cryptoads and then fractionalize those cryptoads and able to give not give but then give a utility that's what I talk about utility versus saying it will make you money but give utility to its own coin which is called the zombie toads have his own coin called brains which if you hold a zombie toad you get 12 brains this coin per day so if you hold two you get 24 a day if you hold two toads zombie toads you can breed a zombie tadpole which 
then I believe probably we'll be able to start to generate probably a lesser amount of brains per day. And you can then take those brains, switch over to like sushi swap, and then go into a liquidity pool with the brains and Ethereum and switch it for Ethereum. For whatever the golden rate is on co towards Ethereum, you can switch it for that. Now you can also make money another way where you, if you have brains and Ethereum, you can provide liquidity to those pools on Sushi Swap, so that say like if you have uh, one hundred and fifty dollars of Ethereum and one hundred and fifty dollars worth of brains, and you put both of them into the liquidity pool on Sushi Swap and leave it there, then the the then other people coming in to trade their sushi out for Ethereum, other people um, bringing Ethereum to buy brains. While that's happening over time, you get a percentage of all those transactions based on how much money you put into it. So that's where people are, are making money in multiple different ways around these situations. And it's, it's, it's crazy because the vast majority of people have no clue that this exists. And if you then hold on. Over time, you have a community like this. So this is happening right now in Cybercons. So Cybercons is like the cryptos, but you see the Ethereum is at a higher floor price. And this is not even a real floor price. This is a floor price of the baby Kongs because they, they lump them all in with babies and the adults. The adults are worth around... The lowest you can get, like an adult Kong, a uh, Cyber Kong, a Genesis, they call them a Genesis, is about 200 Ethereum. So these are the floors for like a 190. Probably some of these are babies, I imagine, too. But the Cyber, the, the, the adult Kongs, I'm not even sure which ones is which. <laughs> they all look the same, but, you know, that's why I don't have a Cyber Kong. They... They're worth about 200 Ethereum, about $700,000 a piece. And they, they generate 10 bananas a day, and each banana is worth on the market $120 US. So your 10 bananas give you about $1,200 every day generated by just staking. So that's another thing. You got to take your zombie toad, and it's not, if you have it, you got to go to another website. And then from your MetaMask, you got to link your MetaMask and stake your, which is give your zombie over to this pot um, where you have to unstake it to get back. And it doesn't, you only have to do is pay gas um, on Ethereum, which could be, you know, depending on how much gas is. But other than that, it's no problem to, um, you're not worried about somebody stealing your toad. So it's safe in that way. You just got to pay gas to stake and unstake it. But by staking it, you get your brains. Or if you stake your Kongs, you get your bananas. And then you got to unstake it to get it back. So that's, you know, kind of the only thing you have to do. But if you're staking your Kong every day, but, you you know, you bought this Kong. I think they came out, if I'm not mistaken. I may be mistaken, but I believe, and we probably can search over here by looking at um, all time that average price yeah they came out somewhere back here. I thought in February but okay they stand back here and um, maybe it goes back further I don't know but anyway it, I believe it came out this year and if you got one of these now it's worth $700,000 the Genesis one and if you're getting your 10 bananas a day, I think you save up to get like 600 bananas, you can make a baby. I'm not sure if you need two Kongs or not, or you just have one and just get 600 bananas. Then you can also use bananas to change the um, bio and the name around your Kong. And But if you didn't do any of that, you can just cash out 1200, close to 1200 bucks a day, which is, you know, get you into almost $400,000 a year. And passive income just holding staking your kong <laughs> so imagine if you bought like four or five of these and just kept it and they see you know start going up like oh i'm gonna hold on these and they said we're gonna come out with these bananas and now you sitting there getting five thousand dollars a day in passive income now life-changing that would be for the vast majority of individuals you'll come across is you know is the rare person who that wouldn't be life-changing for 
But so, you know, that's a, a huge aside I didn't plan on doing right now. So let's just go right into things. Stock market uh, for, for the uh, S&P 500, NASDAQ was up a little bit down, was relatively neutral. Here on this channel, the message is always about what we can do to better ourselves and be positive. And with that, there's others that help us in our life. And even if someone didn't help you, you just want to you think this may help them. Go ahead and say something nice about them down in the comment section and forward this video with them. And with that, Stripe, for those who don't know, is one of these payment processing companies that are kind of behind the scenes. If you buy some online and, it, you know, they sh shunt you over to another page where you put your credit card information in. And, you know, Stripe is one of those companies, right? They got into Bitcoin around 2014, but then got out in 2018. Now they understanding that. Ooh, I done messed up. So, well, hopefully they didn't sell any. Maybe if they generated or got any Bitcoin during that period from 2014 to 2018, hopefully they just held on to it because they would still be very happy individuals. Now, if they then got rid of all their cryptocurrencies, whatever they may have had during that time, then I can understand how they, you know, would be a little bit salty, as they say. Um, before we go much further, none of this is financial advice or spiritual advice or medical advice or anything to be construed in anything my main man said get in 30 russian twists today that is your assignment do it with relish uh so stripe now is getting back into the game they hire four engineers to help is hiring four engineers to form the foundation of a new crypto team. So it's unclear of what exactly they're going to go into it at. A lot of people, Square is someone who competes with Stripe. And Square now, through Cash App, offers the ability to buy. And I think you can even transfer off to separate wallets from, uh, from Cash App. Are they going that direction? I know they were. So I need to talk to you about Jack Dorsey is, um, you know, the, I believe he's the CEO if I'm not mistaken, of Square and also of Bitcoin. Sorry, Twitter. He loves Bitcoin. He would love to be the CEO of that. Talking about how they had um, Square, they're building a, a Bitcoin wallet. I think they're working on a hardware wallet, if I'm not mistaken, and a decentralized exchange. So you got it. You got it. You got to love it. There are more people buying and selling Bitcoin than Tesla, Apple, Microsoft, and Amazon shares. And it just talks about the trading volume. Uh, everybody is, when you, people out on the street be like, she would need me, she would, she would. I was like, oh, we in that stage of the market. I was, well, good thing I got a bag of CV news some time back. But uh, <laughs> I was like, I Bitcoin and Ethereum. Do we worry about Shiba Inu? That's when just you later deep in the game. Then you start running up the Shibas, the Doge, the the Flokies, all that. But anyway, so this is they're looking at the trading volume, Bitcoin trading volume in the first eleven days of October was higher than Tesla, Apple, Amazon, and Micro Share, Micro Share Soft. This doesn't mean about price or anything like that. It's just how much money was exchanging hands back and forth. This can be a good or bad sign. If it's a time of a market of great volatility where you're trying to get rid of money, then it's a bad sign. But here with Bitcoin, it appears to be a good sign because it was a volume increase followed by a raise in price followed by another increase in volume, which is considered bullish. So if you see a volume increase followed by a drop in price, that means a lot of selling was occurring during that time, much more than people were buying. And so it out pressure the buyers with the sales and so the price went down the opposite was occurring where there was a lot of buyers looking to acquire and they sucked up whatever was ever in the market and now they looked around and people had to start bringing in more volume the thing with bitcoin is going to be a point where there ain't gonna be no more volume and i will say ain't like that so it's sticking your brain they ain't, they ain't gonna be no more volume then what do you do you can't just go print more what you do is see the price go astronomical. The White House, Walmart, FedEx, UPS to go 24 hours. And they said also like Target, Samsung. I was like, Samsung? Like who, who looking for them to go 24 hours? And Home Depot to address to the, the supply bottleneck. So they're about to have a big meeting and um, 
they're going to probably, you know, get in front of the cameras and, and, you know, with mask on and do it much different than you saw the last administration when he brought in all of the heads of the big corporations in America to talk about how business is going to help. And here they said, look, the vast majority of the supply chains in the private sector, so they have to be involved in it to, to security. This. They're also going to make the port in Los Angeles and San Francisco, I think, 24 hours. Uh, the port of Los Angeles will move into 24 hours. Long Beach has already been working 24 hours for the past three weeks. Did they say anywhere else? Not San Francisco? I may have made that up. Apologize for that. So, you know, we've been talking a little bit about how the supply chain is going to be a big problem. It looks like, hey, the government's trying to jump in. The United States government is trying to jump in and do something about it. Let's see. Let's, and let's hope that it just helps. Because I did just, uh, just the, the, the very minimum look into a, the dive into where we were at with COVID, but the numbers look somewhat promising. I don't want to, don't quote me on that just yet. So I'm going to, um, after I finish this, I'm going to take a, a better look. I was not in a place where I had all the information I normally could get to really quickly about looking at how I make me feel comfortable about it to understand if I understand. So I'll do that. And then tomorrow I'll discuss that further. Not too crazy. Cause you know, I ain't trying to get bothered yet. Hey, get some attention maybe from, the YouTube algorithm just to be mad at me may be good. According to NASA researchers, warp drive is getting closer to reality. Now, the this talks about a warp drive by this uh, theoret theoretical physicist, Miguel, I know this, Alcubri, 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 I think it's the Alcubri, Alcubri, Alcubri drive. Oh, didn't mention that other I mangle things horribly. And since this is all entertainment, don't believe anything you hear. Go look it up for yourself. That is always the best advice to do. Never trust anybody who say, trust me. You never hear me say that. I'll say, hey, you got to decide for yourself. But th this is how I make my decisions. I go through a bunch of information. I try to find as many viewpoints on the subject, you know, for and against and see who has the... Uh, the stronger argument. And then whatever you think you know, then you start to look to poke holes in it. Alcubri, Alcubri, hold on. Alcubri, Alcubri Drive. So really quickly, and I could stay long on this. I'm trying to do these a little bit shorter. I know I've been rambling. I get to ramble at sometimes. So I'm trying to I'm cut down to the number of of articles per show. I think that'll keep my time down a little bit. I went off with a crazy tangent earlier and I apologize for that, but you know, some people may find it interesting. Anyway, the problem we have with traveling to other solar systems is the vast differences. So we even measure the distances between the solar systems by how long it takes light to travel to those distances, 10, 10 light years. So that, ha that is long. We know how fast light travels, the speed of light. And you, you hear people like, how do you know that? How do we know that? And, and that's people who don't understand science. It's because they've scientifically measured how long the distance and the time it took for light to travel a certain distance. That's how long it took. They measured that actually. I remember when some, one of my friends, was, I'm a little bit off on the tangent, I apologize, we was talking about some guy he wanted to talk to about the, um, I may have mentioned this before, about the, the earth is flat, and he was talking about how he measured the speed of light. I'm like, they measured that back in like the 16th and 17th century using candles and mirrors. <laughs> so you don't understand science if you don't understand how they were able to measure it. And now with the precision of the equipment we have today, you know, it's no question. Anyway, waste my time on that any further. So the problem is that in physics, our standard model of physics, what we understand that as an object travels faster and faster, it gains mass. Not so much mass, but is it is it more like weight? Yeah, they get heavier. So it's not so much the mass change, but the, the, it gets heavier. It's, it's the, the, probably the, you know, I have to look this up, but probably the energy around it where the, it, 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 the 
the mass stays the same, but I guess you could say the, the mass of the system changes. But we'll just do it very simply for now. The faster things go, the heavier they get. And if you're trying to go past the speed of light, the thing becomes, quote unquote, infinitely heavy. So it can't. That's the rule. That things get faster, go faster, they get heavier, and you get to a point where it's so heavy you can't move anymore, and it'll basically have to stop, I imagine, or you know, explode, or who knows what happens at that point. So that was what people thought was the 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 limit to why we were never able to get up to the speed of light, and to be able to go faster than the speed of light, and to be able to travel to these other you know, anywhere in our universe in, in a way that would make sense in our, what we perceive as our lifespans at this moment, right? Long and short of it being that, well, some people said, well, maybe just get super close to it, but not that much where, you know, the mass becomes, it stops us, which would take a tremendous amount of energy to, to generate the power to get up to that type of speed, pushing that type of mass, even though we're not, you know, Say if we were just going at eight tenths of the speed of light, a lot of energy um, requirement for that. So, um, Al Kubri came up with the idea of, well, and, and you know you gotta love this about the way we we humans see the world and everything is that well, maybe we can just find a workaround, a, a hack to it, maybe we don't have to travel faster than the speed of light. What if we just change space and time around the vehicles? What does that mean? So we, all of this stuff is space, distance, and time. That's how we calculate speed and how the universe is measured. So if you're able to then manipulate that in and of itself, space and time, then the distance doesn't quite, or if you manipulate space and time, you can manipulate time in a way that, you know, kind of goes around the rule of the speed of light. So you can travel faster than that, what we would perceive as the speed of light without breaking the standard model of physics. And so the way he thought of doing this is where you would have a vehicle that creates a bubble around it. And in that bubble of negative energy, it would drop um, space in front of it while expanding space out behind it. Contract the space in front of it, drop it down, contract it, and expand it out. Now, this has been a theory of how, quote-unquote, UAPs or UFOs, extraterrestrial vehicles, have been traveling around in our solar system and throughout is that they manipulate um, space to where they are able to contract it and pull themselves along. Instead of pushing, like, you know, our thrust engines push something out the back and push that thrust pushes our planes forward this actually pulls the vehicle so you just collapse space a little bit in front of you and expand it out behind you and then you're pulled through that space much faster than you know what we would perceive as the speeds of space and time I apologize for hitting that so he came up with this in the 90s everybody said hey that you know it sounds interesting you know um, boy, blah, 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 you know, what, what we're going to do. And it's still, you know, still need a tremendous amount of energy and the energy to calculate it for him to do. It, I think he said it would be like the mass of, of Jupiter. So while it sounded good, it would still be fairly difficult to, um, you need the mass of propeller spacecraft, such a level you need the mass equivalents of Jupiter. So that's still, you know, we get, we're not making ships the size of Jupiter, using fuel the size of Jupiter yet. You know, that it's a different time here. But now you have this NASA engineer, uh, Dr. White, who is looking at ways that believe in it. And this article is super vague. I gotta go look up exactly what the theory is on here. But they're talking about bending ways in physics. I don't know what that matter to bring down the mass energy requirement and also uh, changing the shape of the ring of the negative mass. The negative mass is the shape of the sphere that the vehicle was in that's generating um that ability to kind of constrict and expand behind it so supposedly they're looking to build this white jude warp field inferometer it is a beam splitting a beam splitting inferometer which can easily detect and generate the tiniest warp bubbles so supposedly nasa is working on the, the basic science of this technology of warping space and time in a control field which would be a warp drive so sounds crazy right but 
It does until it's, to, until it's reality. With that said, I love you. You love you. God loves us. And that's all that matters.